Okay, this video is an uh, uh, attempt to answer some questions about my ABO setup and my tools. I have some questions here that uh, I was asked. They're pretty good questions. Uh, some of these are answered in my other videos, but uh, I'm going to take this opportunity to consolidate this, this information because the other, it, you'd have to watch quite a few videos to get the information uh, that these questions ask, ask for. So let's see, the first question is, um, are there names to the rocks you prefer for hammer stones, or do you just look for certain qualities to the stone as mentioned in the beginner series? Okay, uh, yes, there are names for the stones. Uh, I know what they are now. At, at first I didn't know what they were. Uh, I would just look for certain qualities at first. I knew that I needed soft hammer stones and hard hammer stones by watching other YouTube videos when I was beginning. So what I looked for in a hard hammer stone was you know roughness, heaviness, and toughness. Now I found out later that these are called quartzite stones, the ones I prefer. Now this one looks more like the traditional quartz rocks that you'd see in a rock shop or something. This is quartzite, but this is also quartzite. It's just a different color and the crystals are smaller. But they have the same properties. They're rough, they're heavy, and they're very strong. And uh, they're good for, these are medium-sized hammer stones. They're good for spalling. Uh, this is also a, a hard hammer stone. Now, I don't know what this is. Um, I got a feeling it's probably quartzite as well because of the way it crumbles. It's just a different shade of quartz. This here is an actual artifact that a friend of mine gave me. Uh, Don Tower gave me this. This is a real artifact, a real hammer stone, a hard hammer stone used by Native Americans. And what's interesting about these artifacts is you can see the use wear. Now you can see there's a large amount of use on the side here. And that was for, looks like it was scraping the edge of a, a preform or, or a, an edge of a piece you're working on to, to dull the edge. And they used quite a bit of that surface. And you can see the ends have been used for hammering. And this looks like it was used for dulling. Uh, we don't know what the age of this hammer stone is, but it's, uh, it's very, very interesting as far as the different facets on it. This is my version here. It's not completely worn down like, like the real one, but you can see the beginnings of the same kind of use wear. Now for the soft hammer stones, uh, what I mean by soft is that you can scratch them easily. And uh, they they produce a chalky chalky powder when you do that. I believe this one is sandstone and this one is limestone. I know for sure this one is limestone. This one, not quite sure, but I think it's sandstone. And this one, I don't know what it is, but they're all on the soft side as far as being able to scratch them. This one is tougher than these other two. But I still consider this a soft hammer stone. Now, um, I still collect my hammer stones based on properties and not really concerned about the type of rock it is. I just look for the basic qualities of roundness and uh, toughness and roughness. Let's see. The next question. Uh, same same thing on my larger Brady stone. Okay. Get a close look on, at my large Brady stone. This is a quartzite stone also. And uh, I used to use this a lot for braiding. Um, and I also put my foot on it to elevate my knee. Uh, the way I use it is just to get rid of the sharp edges so I can find a good platform to strike. Uh, it's a quick way to 
Stolen edge. Uh, I'd rather this is a little bit smooth. I, I would prefer something more rough, so I don't use this as often. What I do is I use the concrete blocks that I sit on. Now I use these for braiding. But uh, I do want to get another one that's rougher than this. Uh, but I use this for other things too. I, I've used this for pounding sinew as a base for pounding sinew and softening in sinew. But I think that one is quartzite. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> I just uh, picked them on properties. Uh, this is another type of <clears throat> stone I use for abrading my antler tools. And it, it is sandstone. And it works pretty good for abrading uh, the antler tools. Now, I, I'm not going to use this for abrading the, uh, the rock because it's so thin. I think it'll wear out too fast. Okay, let's see. Uh, how much skull should I look to have attached to a moose billet? And what size mallet do I prefer? Okay. Now when I cut these, these are moose antler that were attached to the skull. I got the skull of the moose with the, uh, the antlers and it was all one big, uh, one big complete set and I cut them I cut them apart oops I didn't uh, this is about the thickness of the skull itself and just beyond it would be the brain cavity I have I didn't abrade this down very much I just smoothed it made it round but that's basically the thickness of the skull right there where the antler joins the skull so I guess that's what I use to measure the how much bone I have attached uh, it will wear out, it will wear down. It takes a while, it takes a, I guess a few years for it to wear down if you use it regularly. Uh, the more you have, the, the less wear on each one. And I'm, I'm preferring to use this one more and more instead of this heavier one. Now as far as the mallets, oh and the reason why I like the smaller one is because it's, it's just less strain on my wrist. I can hold it like this. And it's a lot less strain. Uh, this one here it has some torque to it, so it, it uh, after a while my wrist gets sore. Now the size of mallets I prefer, I guess it's going to be about the same as a knife handle. Uh, well, maybe a little heavier than a knife handle. Something that's not going to uh, put undue uh, strain on my wrist, and something with a natural or it doesn't have to be natural, but something with an angle on it, so I'm, I'm not going to hit my work by accident. If this was out straight and cut off straight like this, this corner can strike my work by accident. So I use this one here. I'm also using the, uh, you'll see in a couple videos, I'm using this uh, ultra high molecular weight plastic. And I believe that's inch and a half. Let's see. It might be two inches. Yeah, inch and a half. This feels just like antler to me. So I use I'm starting to use this and saving my antler for billets. Uh, when I'm doing strictly abo though, I do use my antler mallets. Um, let's see, when it comes to tines. What are you looking for? Length, diameter, and what would be the difference between deer and elk tines? Any other types of tines that uh, should be considered? Okay, what I look for in a tine, the first thing I look for is the quality of the antler itself. It's got to be good hard antler. Second is the straightness. I can't use antlers that are uh, really curved if I'm using them for indirect percussion. If I'm using them strictly for pressure, it's fine to have it curved. This is a pressure flaker. It actually feels good to have a, a curved pressure flaker. But for indirect percussion, I look for l the length and the straightness of it and the quality of it. I don't want to see cracks anywhere on the antler. It's got to be good hard antler. And before I use them, I, get, I make sure they're dry. So I either take a heat gun and warm up the tips or I set them next to a, a fire or leave them in the sun for a little while 
it has to be very dry when working with these. Uh, other types of antler, um, I started by using elk. Let's see, one of these is an elk antler. This is, this is, mallet is actually elk, and you can see it has quite a bit of pith in it. Uh, the outside is very hard, but once you get through the outside, if you wear it out, the pith is very soft, so uh, it doesn't last quite as long as moose. Well, it doesn't last nearly as long as moose, because moose is solid all the way through. I mean, that's, there's no, there's some, por there's some porosity in there, but it's, it's very solid. It's not like the elk. So, I switched over to using mainly whitetail and um, moose for my abo. This is whitetail here. There is a pith in the middle, but it's it's uh, tougher than elk. So I, I stopped using elk tines and uh, switched over to whitetail. I find that whitetail actually is the hardest, the hardest, toughest antler I can get. This here is uh, axis deer antler. Now this is, is very solid, about like the moose, but it um, cracks a lot easier than whitetail. So most of my tools now are made from uh, whitetail, my pressure flakers and my indirect percussion punches. I've got a few, uh, I've got a couple of these that are wooden pressure flakers and this is uh, moose antler, sections of moose antler that I uh, just carved down and sanded down to fit into the holes in these pressure flakers. But I prefer moose or uh, whitetail. Okay. Um, let's see. What is the importance of the bison horn pad? Well, I, I bought some bison horn because I thought it was, it would be cool to make uh, some arrowheads out of the horn, but I found that they were, it was too flexible for arrowheads. And so I just, instead of, um, you know, putting it away, I started to cut out these discs for pads, for flint napping. And they work very well. Uh, one of the main advantages that I think is the dark color. I can see what I'm doing with, with a dark color background. Uh, but I don't have to use antler. Um, it's got a natural curve to it already, which is good because when I put it down, I don't have to worry about. Uh, it, I don't have to worry about it being soft in the middle and snapping my arrowhead as I'm pressure flaking it. Because if I put it on my hand and I push in with just a leather pad by itself, a lot of times I snap it right down the middle because it's my hand's soft and. It, It'll just push down in the middle. But with a pad, when you're pushing down, the pressure is, is uh, resisting right where you're pushing. So you, you're not putting pressure on the ends that could snap it if you put your pressure flaker in the middle and push down hard. It just, the ends are suspended. Um, that's, a, that's the significance of the shape, but you can use rocks too, you, as long as they're convex. I've got all kinds of different rocks that I use for pads, and you can put a piece of leather over the top, and it, it keeps the, the work, uh, the ends of the work suspended so that they're not touching anything, and when you're pressure flaking, don't have to worry about it snapping because you're bridging it, if that makes sense. Uh, there's no real significance be behind the buffalo pad. I don't see any advantage uh, to using it other than the color. Okay. Uh, what is the purpose of your heat treating your chert? And are you just putting it in an oven? Yeah. I'm just putting it in an oven, in a, in a turkey roaster. Uh, the, the reason why I heat treat it is because a lot of stone, a lot of raw stone is is workable, but it becomes a lot more workable with heat. Um, it basically turns a rock into a glass. That's the simplest way for me to put it. 
it'll be it'll be rough it'll be dull uh, it'll be very hard to uh, use abo tools on raw stone but if we cook this it comes out like this and you can see it fractures a lot differently a lot more ripples in it a lot more glass like it's shinier sometimes it changes color a lot of times uh, the colors are desirable for um, replicating certain pieces that you see because the Native Americans did heat treat their stone quite a bit and that's the only way to get certain colors so the reason why I heat treat is it just makes it easier to use antler on it and it overall it's uh, just uh, saves a lot of saves a lot of work and yeah I put it in the oven uh, I heat it up to a certain temperature like 400 degrees uh, there are charts online that tell you how to cook certain types of stone and those are good you can use those as a guide but I just basically throw everything in at 400 and whatever breaks breaks and whatever doesn't really respond I don't use it so <laughs> um, most of it will come out fine at 400 degrees and uh, the process is uh, I just put it in there turn it on and it the, the oven warms up I don't uh, warm it up gradually I just let the oven warm up by itself now when I turn the oven off I'll just turn it all the way down to zero and let it cool for I don't know six eight hours come back and check it if and put my hand on the rock if it's still really hot I just keep it in there for several more hours until I can open it and the rock is ambient temperature or temperature of the atmosphere and then I take it out and I start working with it uh, the important thing is to cool it slowly and heat it slowly uh, the cooling part is more important I think than the heating part so you can heat it much faster than you can cool it if you cool it fast or unevenly it will crack and if you heat it uh, as long as it's dry you can heat it very quickly without cracking it uh, if the rock contains moisture uh, you'll need to heat it at a lower temperature like 200 degrees to uh, get that moisture out before you crank it up to 400 okay and okay I guess that's the end of the questions there thanks John for asking those questions that uh, I hope that clarifies uh, for a lot of people uh, those things um, there's a few more things I might want to add uh, my Abo toolkit contains uh, different size pads of different types of leather uh, this here is a uh, vegetable tan leather it's nice and hard uh, stiff I can uh, use it for spalling large pieces of rock and it absorbs quite a bit of shock and impact this I use uh, a lot because it's black I can see what I'm doing I can I can roll it up to uh, do pressure flaking or I can leave it out like this and put it on my pad and just pressure flake on my lap this is a piece of brain tan and I just have this in here so I know what what the original nappers used and it's very similar to uh, modern tanned leather except it's a lot softer it's a uh, it's a lot spongier also but it's, you know uh, there's not much difference between this the brain tan as far as flint napping goes and regular modern tanned leather I do have a, a hammer stone that uh, I use for notching and for getting into into tight spots and this is uh, rhyolite and I use this if I want to make a, a large notch quickly I use the edge of this rhyolite against the uh, softer the much softer heat treated stone and I can quickly notch out an area 
either by direct percussion or just by sawing at it. Um, I think that's it. I used to use real small hammer stones, but they didn't work out very well. And the large hammer stones are overkill, basically. This is my largest hammer stone. They can handle it, you know, all the spalls that I need up to, uh, you know, six inch long knives. That's it.